You may be seated. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would be first in our hearts, that we would love you above all things. We know in our natural state and the way we came into this world, we were incapable of such love. Such love comes only from you. And we praise you that through your son, and through his death in our place, you have loved us and poured out in our hearts a love for you, a love for one another, and a love for those around us who do not yet know you. And we pray that you would accomplish uh, the visible manifestation of your love through us. In Jesus' name, amen. We gather every week and we love to celebrate the Lord's death until he returns. This is not a celebration of a a tragedy. It's a celebration of a victory uh, that God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came on behalf of believers, laid his own life down, and rose from the grave to secure life for all who would believe in him. It's a, a thrill just to do this every week. And uh, you who are believers here, you know we, we sort of do the, the same thing every week. This is an opportunity to look at God's word for a few moments, uh, to uh, remember the Lord's death together. Uh, to rejoice in the forgiveness that he's purchased for us. You will have a, a moment uh, or two and a few moments to reflect on your own heart. That, that time of silence is designed for self-examination, opportunity for you to reflect on uh, the state of your own heart and confess any known sins to the Lord and uh, enjoy the forgiveness that Christ purchased. It's an opportunity for you as well to make plans in your heart to turn from sin, to repent, um, to set things right. Um, and so uh, look forward to encouraging all of us believers to do that. Um, it's an opportunity for us to together proclaim Jesus' death in our place. One of the things we also do uh, each week is, is just an attempt to explain the gospel, to explain Jesus' death in the place of believers. And And we recognize that there are people who have not yet embraced Christ with us week in and week out as we do this. And so while not leaving believers behind this morning, I do want to address you here this morning who have not yet embraced Christ. And and there are many of you who are here uh, who haven't embraced Christ who have been going to church your whole life. And perhaps there are some in this room who are visiting and maybe stepped into the church for the first time or the first time in a long time. And so what I want to do is turn our attention to Revelation chapter 20. And if you don't have a Bible, we have men here with Bibles. They're going to walk down the aisles. Just slip your hand up. Let them know that you'd like to have a copy of God's Word. And you can follow along uh, as we read. And and really, I want to direct our our thoughts about Christ, uh, particularly to you who uh, don't yet know Christ, don't yet have life. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 7, we're looking at a time period at the end of what's known as the millennial kingdom, when Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years, Satan is locked up. Uh, It will be really a remarkable time in human history. But verse 7 begins with a time period after that, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. And the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth, and they surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever." It's a sobering scene, Uh, perhaps uh, the scene of a future world we're not particularly familiar with, what is going on here. I I just want to draw out one really important feature of what God describes, and that is when when humanity, in, in its best days, still roots for the underdog. When humanity set up on, on its best footing, when there is world peace and everybody's getting along the way we've all wished that the world would somehow figure out a way to do, Jesus will do that. 
And yet there will be those who have not experienced new life from Jesus, who will be hoping against hope that some guy who's been locked up for a long time will get out and we can be on his team and maybe there's a chance that I can continue to live my Jesus's life, Jesus-less life, and survive it. And Revelation chapter 20 is the culmination of things we see like this in the book of Revelation. Over and over and over again, people on the earth will choose to follow the Antichrist because what the Antichrist gives humanity is an opportunity to still hold on to my sin and, and, and maybe not be destroyed for it. And you just need to know, this is the condition of the human heart. This is the condition of the human heart that we were all born with. What can I do to continue to live the life I want to live? What do I need to do to continue to hold on to the things that I hold dear and, and get away with it? And, and for you who have walked on this earth for a while apart from Christ, you might suspect that, hey, there's a pathway forward for me to live without Jesus and to get away with it. And things have gone well for me so far. I, you just need to know they won't go well for you in the end. That when Jesus finishes up this battle and mops up his enemies in the end, it, it, it's not a climactic, drawn-out war scene. It's one fell swoop. And you must know that while you are alive here and breathing today, there is hope for you. There is life for you. But it means you can't live like those in Revelation 12 who, who knew that the wrath of the Lamb is coming down upon them and, and yet they would not repent of their evil deeds. They, they just refused to give up sin. And, and, and they just hoped that living without Jesus, uh, there was some way they could survive. They could, they could still have what they wanted to have and still be okay. And, and this morning, I just want us to be warned of what's to come and encouraged at what is to come. You see, if you let go of your sin and, and trade that for Christ... If you let go of your human religions and trade them for Christ, if you let go of your autonomy, you're your, your in the driver's seat doing life the way you want to do it, if you let go of that and you have Christ, listen, you get everything and you just trade it up from trash. There's no comparison to having Christ. There's no comparison to having the new life that is in Christ. Following Jesus is not about, okay, I need to be good, I need to follow a bunch of rules. No, you get a person, the infinite person of the Lord Jesus Christ, as your treasure. He becomes your Lord and your friend and your Savior and your everything. And listen, no one who has turned their back on the stuff of this world to follow Christ has regretted it. You just know Him to be everything. And, and, and those who have loved Christ have said things like, take everything, take the world, take my life, all that stuff. You can have it because I have him. And if you have not yet embraced Christ because you're holding on to something, and you think maybe you can hold on to that something and, and still hold on to it, you must know that Jesus is coming back. And, and he will ask account for your life and what you've done with it, and what you've done with him. Would you turn to him today? Find life and forgiveness for all your crimes, past, present, and future, and reconciliation and love in God. The men are going to come forward now, and they're going to distribute a little cracker and a little cup of juice. That is for believers in Jesus Christ to eat the bread, to drink the cup, and to celebrate the Lord's death. If, if that's not you this morning, just let those pass you by, but would beg you just to repent and believe. I'll rejoin us again in a few moments in prayer.